that you at such times seeing me never shall by the pronouncing of some doubtful phrases well well we know or we could and if we would or such ambiguous giving out denote you know aught of me this do swear so grace and mercy at your best need help you When, in 1937, you did Hamlet at, at, at the Old Vic, I believe you and Tony Guthrie worked out a rather original approach to the character. <laughs> yes. That was inspired by a man whose name was Professor Ernest Jones, who wrote a book, the title of which I'm afraid I can't remember. But it was concerning itself with Hamlet in the light of the Oedipus complex. Now, he made a, a really watertight case about this. And we believed in it thoroughly. And although I would not go so far as to say that that's all the play is about now, I did in those days. I thought that that was the absolute resolution of all the problems concerning Hamlet. And it, for what little use it had, it at least gave one a central idea which seemed to fulfill the great vacuum provided by all the crossed ideas about Hamlet, what he really was, what he really wasn't. Uh, whether he's a man of action, whether he wasn't a man of action. Now, he could perfectly safely be a man of action under the auspices of that particular idea that he couldn't kill the king because, subconsciously, of course, couldn't kill the king because he was guilty himself. Now, although now I think there are many more things in Hamlet than that, but I, I still would favor the idea that... Uh, if there is such a thing as an Oedipus complex, which we know perfectly well there is, it was not entirely absent from the Royal Court of Denmark. How did you get on with uh, Tyrone Guthrie as a director? Oh, very well. Very well indeed. He had brilliant conceptions of uh, crowd scenes, of shape, of grouping, of pace, of those sort of external things. He never seemed to touch into the heart of the matter very much. He always seemed to me in those days to be a, a wee bit nervous of the intimacies. Um, I remember, I just remember, that in Henry V, he would always say to me and Jessica Tandy, you two go and do the love scene by yourselves, will you? I can't be bothered with that. And it seemed to me that he was a little bit shy of great human emotion. In those first two seasons, pre-war at the LV, you played, amongst other things, Henry V, Macbeth, Iago, Coriolanus, and Coriolanus was really acclaimed as a great performance, but did you think it was your best performance of the series? No, I'd obviously got much more proficient in that time. And I'd been on the stage now 13 years, and I suppose my voice had got deeper. Coriolanus doesn't require a very deep uh, mental faculty, I don't think. It doesn't require very great cerebral heights in the, in the artist performing him. He's a very straightforward, reactionary son of a so-and-so, and, uh, and it's quite easy to get onto him. And his thoughts are not deep. You've just got to appreciate what he is and make quite sure that he is a patrician, first and foremost, and um, that his pride is of the nature that he's too proud to even accept praise. Eighteen years later, at Stratford, you did new versions of Macbeth and Coriolanus. Did you mm. change your approach to the parts at all? Not in Coriolanus. Not in Coriolanus. But Macbeth is another problem altogether. Macbeth is something which, I don't care how boss a shot you have of it if you're at it, I mean, if you're 27 years old, you can't do it. You can't do it, although you can recite it, you can go through the motions, you can give them a hell of a fight at the end, you can reach reach all sorts of uh, poetic passages, perhaps. You can reach the humanities to a certain degree, but only to a certain degree, because you have to be of a certain age of life's experience to play parts as enormous as that. You have to know about humanity. You have to know a lot about human relationships. See, Macbeth is a domestic tragedy. It's, um, you must see in that, you must understand and perceive that Macbeth knows at once, the minute he sees the first 
which. He knows. He knows what's going to happen. He's the interesting part of the play is that the man has imagination and that the woman has none. The man sees it all, she does not. That's what gives her the enormous courage to plot the whole thing, force him into it, persuade him, cajole him, bully him, tease him into it. And he allows himself gradually, bit by bit, to be teased into it. But he knows the answer. He knows the result, and she doesn't. And it's sort of, it's the passage of two people doing that, one going up and one going down. And there comes a moment in the play when he looks at her, and he realizes that she can't take it anymore. Have you find it difficult to find bits of yourself in the evil characters you played? What you need to make up your makeup as an actor is uh, observation, intuition. You must, at its most highfaluting, uh, the ex most highfaluting expression of it, the actor is as important as the illuminator of the human heart, he's as important as the psychiatrist or the doctor, minister, if you like. That's putting him very high and mightily. At the opposite end of that pole, you've got to find in the actor a man who will not be too proud to scavenge that tiniest little bit of human circumstance. Observe it, use it, find it, use it sometime or another. I've frequently observed things, and thank God, if I haven't got a very good memory for anything else, but I've got a memory for little details. And I've had things in my back of my mind for as long as 18 years before I've used them. And the, perhaps in those little tiny things, maybe the key to a whole characterization. We're going to look now at a scene from the film of Richard III. It's the scene after Richard has successfully made love to the widow of one of his victims. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? Was ever woman in this humor won? My dukedom to a widow's chastity, I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life, she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvelous, proper man. I be at charges for a looking glass, and entertain some score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favor with myself, I will maintain it to some little cost. Shine out, fair sun, till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. Did you know at the time that that was going to be one of the key performances of your career? No. No. A lot of things contributed to what I said, talking about scavenging just now. One thing that may lead an actor to be successful in a part, it may, not always, but may, is to try to be unlike somebody else in it. At the time when I took over that part, first of all, Donald Wolfitt had made an enormous success in the part, only 18 months previously. And I didn't want to play the part at all, because I thought it was much too close to this colleague's success. And uh, I had seen it. And when I was learning it, I could hear nothing but Donald's voice in my mind's ear and uh, see nothing but him in my mind's eye. And so I thought, this won't do. I've, I've just got to think of something else. Well, my first thought, I'd, I'd always had images, pictures, I'd heard imitations of old actors um, imitating Henry Irving. And so I did right away an imitation of these old actors imitating Henry Irving's voice. That's why I took that on a sort of narrow kind of vocal address. Then I thought about looks, and I thought about the big bad wolf. And I thought about a director under whom I had suffered an extremist in New York called Jed Harris. The physiognomy of the Big Bad Wolf was said to have been founded upon Jed Harris. And so, hence the nose, which originally was very much bigger than it was finally in the film. And so with one